Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife and sword maker, Dan Keffler. Dan is a man of many talents, balancing his knife and sword making career with his chiropractic practice. And don't forget the many championship belts he's earned in his years as a star blade sports competitor. So renowned in, is Dan in the blade sports circle that he got to show off his considerable talents with a blade on late night TV. But to me, the draw is Keffler's exquisite swords from the Japanese inspired super assassin. Well, I love that name to the absolute favorite of my uh, of mine, the K-18 double edged three handed short sword. I need this particular sword in my life, and that is a need, not a want. Anyway, we're going to find out what inspired its creation and how he makes this beast. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download us uh, wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also join on Patreon, where you get bonus knife content, including interview extras and monthly knife giveaways. Check it out at thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh man, it's my pleasure. And uh, so, as I hinted in the in the intro, we'll just get right to that little tidbit, so people aren't wondering too long. Tell me about this late night uh, TV sojourn. Uh, so we, I, I'm affiliated with an organization called Blade Sports International, and I've been. Uh, gosh, I started in 2009, so shoot, it's been about 12 years. COVID's kind of made the time frame uh, uh, weird. But uh, so going into our national championships, we hold a, a national championships and a world championships every year. You qualify for nationals by attending uh, so many cuts and then uh, th they accumulate points and how you score and you're ranked and then you get put into nationals. Um, so uh, going into nationals, we um, we were informed that uh, Jimmy Kimmel had uh, reached out to Blade Sports and. Uh, having a little trouble with that sandwich there uh, <laughs> that he'd reach out to his, you know, his team had reached out to blade sports and um, uh, we're interested. They'd seen some of our videos on YouTube. And so they were interested in, you know, having somebody on. And so we made it so that the person that won na the national championships that, that year was the person that got to go. Oh, that's so and cool. so that was actually like an extra incentive to win. Uh, so that you could go do cool stuff like this, like chop a, a, a squawking goose's head <laughs> and stuff. So um, that that actual cut on Jimmy Kimmel was, you know, it was just meant to be comedy and goofy yeah. and everything like that. It, it wasn't um, particularly, uh, you know, skill oriented. Right. But uh, but yeah, it, you know, they they made TV out of it. So for those who aren't watching, uh, you were on Jimmy Kimmel Late Night Show, and he has you doing a um, – well, we're, we're going to talk a bit about Blade Sports and, and clear up some um, some questions people might have about it. But uh, a, a, uh, a competition is called a cut. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it's a cutting competition. Yeah. A cutting competition. So yeah. he had you do sort of a satir – not satirical, a, a yeah. comedic – No, actually comedic, satirical yeah, yeah. version uh, of it. Yeah, well, you're cutting that the magic eight balls and uh -huh. and the tequila bottles and 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 uh, it's awesome. But really, what's what's underlying it is you can see. I was I was watching him, and you can see when you pull unsheathe that knife, he's dazzled. I mean, he is drawn into that. And I don't think of Jimmy Kimmel necessarily as a knife guy. Yeah. Uh, what What was the experience of of being on that show like? You know, they treated me really good. Um, they contacted me after I'd won the world championship. They contacted me and we talked about uh, the weekend that I, or the days that I would go there. Um, they flew me down there. Um, and <clears throat> before we, we went on the show, 
I got to talk with the producers. And the great thing is I've been on TV shows before. And my experience with a lot of the TV shows is that you have novices telling you what to do that don't completely understand your genre. And it's kind of frustrating when, you know, you're, you're at a point at which you have the most experience, but you're being told and, and, and having stuff put in front of you that isn't thought out well. But with them, I was really impressed because their producers contacted me and we brainstormed and just came up with ideas. And they were like, hey, is this possible? This would be fun. This would be neat. And I think it would make, you know, good. The camera would pick it up well. And so we kind of worked out and built that course with different ideas. Some of them were my influence. Um, and then, you know, some of them were me giving them an idea of what's realistic and what's not. And others were just some of their ideas that panned out really well and were, were cute um, and stuff. So that's how that was put together. Then they flew me down. Uh, I think I was down in California about three days uh, down in Los Angeles. I got to walk around on Hollywood Boulevard and watch uh, everybody do people worship, which is a little different than where I'm from. But uh, it was interesting and fun. Uh, they put me up in a nice hotel. And uh, actually, while I was down there, I was across the street from the Chinese theater where they were doing the premiere for John Wick 3. Oh, and so cool. Keanu Reeves and Holly Berry were there. And I got to see I just looked out my window and I got to see them doing the put their feet in the concrete and their handprints in the concrete and everything. And that was kind of a, a cool experience. Um, then I got to watch the show the night before. And then uh, we went over like just kind of some layout and a little bit of rehearsal, just how the show's going to go. And uh, and then it was live. So it was, it was pretty cool. It was a really neat experience. They did. They treated me really good. Uh, they picked me up at the airport, put me up in a hotel. They had great communication. And, uh, and then uh, we did the show. And then I actually had to get back. I had some chiropractic training to get back to. So I literally got done cutting that stuff. And I, you know, basically went off stage, watched, uh, I walked through Slipknot, took a selfie real quick, because um, that was the group that was playing, jumped in a, a, a limo, and they took me to the airport, and I got on a plane. Man, that's a whirlwind, whirlwind experience. And who would think that we don't generally think of knives and uh, quote unquote knife life as taking us, you know, into the heart of the glitterati, you know, right there at Hollywood and getting on TV. But that's really cool, man. And I think yeah. it's cool that they uh, that they featured Blade Sports um, yeah. on, on that show, gave it gave it some exposure. Um, all right. Before we get any further, you mentioned chiropractic. And I mentioned it also in in your intro. Uh, you make uh, you you compete in blades sports, and you make uh, really nice knives and swords. But you, this is not your full time gig. Uh, how how did this come about? Well, you know, I um I got my undergrad in two thousand and two. In uh in two thousand and one, fall of two thousand one, I've always been interested in swords and knives. I had a motorcycle accident and I was kind of laid up. I had a surgery on my wrist and I got online and just was like, you know, uh, looking through at different, uh, kitchen knives and stuff. And then I saw, uh, uh some, I, I saw actually Daniel Ellis. He, uh, is an ABS mastersmith. Who's a, a knife. Uh, he runs some things out of California. I think he's like a knife purveyor now, as well as a mastersmith and a real knowledgeable guy. I just got on his website and, I was like, wow, people make their own lives. I heard about the ABS. And then I got on a knife forum. At the time, it was called Custom Knife Directory. And I just started looking. And then there was a person uh, that was about 20 miles north of where I grew up that made knives. It was on the forum. And he reached out. I talked to him. He invited me up to his shop and showed me how to make like a four-inch hunter. And uh, out of 1095 and some uh, laminated wood. And I was just like totally hooked. I had an art background before and some other things I was really into just working with my hands. But when I found knife making, it, it was just like a calling. It was something that got to use every skill I ever developed. And then you end up with a really cool knife that you get to do cool things with uh, at the end. Um, so as I was working, I graduated for, with, with my undergrad. I had uh, my first daughter uh, and worked around and then decided, uh, you know, I'd go back to school after work on some jobs I didn't like. I'd been making knives and selling them here and there, but hadn't really gotten a name for myself. Um, and then uh, a combination of things came together. I found Blade Sports, started competing with Blade Sports, started developing some skills that uh, an understanding of a better understanding of performance 
at the same time, well, just before that, about five years before that, really started working into developing some things with swords. Uh, and, and then I went into chiropractic school, but as I went into chiropractic school, that's when my knife making became more popular. My name got out a bit more, started getting more orders. And I actually could have quit chiropractic school and just, you know, gone to the knife making thing, but you're hundreds of thousands of dollars into student loan debt by that time. So I might as well do do both. And, uh, and so, yeah, I'm actually, I'm a part-time chiropractor. I actually, uh, work three days a week and then the other three days or four days I get to do in the shop and be with my family. And it's a, it's a pretty cool life. Um, I've actually been really, really blessed in a lot of ways. Ah, that sounds, it sounds really cool because you have variety also. It's like uh, yes. two, two very interesting pursuits or three very interesting pursuits that are all quite different. Uh, even though blade sports is related to making knives, it's a, it's a physical pursuit. It's something different. Uh, mm -hmm. than, than actually making them. So you were making the knives before you got into the blade sports. Correct. Um, but but then you indicated that actually being in the blade sports and using knives in in such in 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 one event in which the knife is being called upon in so many different ways and you have to use the knife in so many different ways. How did that help you with your re refine your knife making? So it really gave the knife purpose. Um, my swords had purpose because I, uh, I have another story that we'll get back to about kind of some of the things that really got me into the, into swords. But I've always been a fanatic about performance. Um, I'm always uh, form uh, form before fun. I mean function before form, but I, I like form as well. Um, but what Blade Sports does is it gives us this um, really neat testing ground. We have lots of of data already um, accumulated based off of what works and what doesn't work. So we're dealing with steel selection. So we have a basic knife design. Let me grab my comp knife mm -hmm. right here. So we have a, a I, I don't know if you want to call it basic, but um, so this is a 10 inch blade. Um, we based the dimensions in, initially off of the ABS, 10 inches, no greater than two inches wide and no, no greater than 15 inches overall. But because we developed what the, the tasks, the demands for this blade would be um, based off of the course, then you can figure out which ways you can make a knife better to perform in those demands. And a lot of those demands would carry over to real life use and it's carried over to my knife and sword making and the pieces that I produce just for uh, people to use and not compete with blade sports and stuff. So with those demands are you want something to be really sharp, really thin at the edge, but it has to be really hard, but maintain toughness. And the thing about steel is that you can be tough, sharp, and hard, but you can only pick two mm -hmm. and stuff. But what we've done with the development and the understanding of heat treat and modern metallurgy is we've tried to get all three. And, and in this, this example right here with this material, um, I can put this, you could see how, um, oh, wow. acute that edge gets. It's not, I mean, there's very little of a primary bevel. It, it's basically a giant 10 inch razor. Um, <laughs> and it stays this way and sharp all the way through the course. In fact, this just got done with two cutting courses uh, two weeks ago in, uh, Oklahoma. And, uh, I, it's it's still extremely sharp it may need just a little strop to get back to competition sharp but um it's it's still ready to go this is a um, uh, extra super clean what's the steel what is this this is this is actually venatus four extra it's a buller udahome steel and it's probably the it's the steel that i've determined that i've used is all uh, with all the ones that i've tested as most successful steel for for a blade sports knife many other steels work but this one can achieve a thinner um thinner and sharper edge and still maintain durability okay uh, i'm sorry that you put that knife away before you put it away i want to talk a little bit about the anatomy of a competition chopper uh, because okay. uh, maybe people aren't familiar with these knives and they haven't seen them i know the first time i saw a competition chopper i, I was of course i'm a knife junkie so i was like oh man that's so cool but uh, so one thing you notice immediately is that apparently Blade Sports doesn't ask for anything with the point. No puncturing, no thrusting. Um, Correct. 
first of all, why is that? And then tell us about about the the edge and the and the actual design, the profile of this particular knife. Okay, so um, basically, uh, all of the stuff is is chopping and slicing. We don't have any stabbing or, or poking movements in blade sports. Um, two reasons: one is uh, the mission statement of blade sports is the um, promotion of uh, the safe promote the promotion of knives is used as tools. The safe use of knives is tools. I should have that roll off my tongue better, but uh, it's late. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we just don't have any stabbing motions uh, with the knife. Um, it's a uh, because of the people that we bring in and the way it's challenging and everything like that, it's just one of those things that can lead to injury that we just can't afford to have. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so your next question is, is kind of the anatomy of a, 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 a competition knife. Um, mine is set up particularly, I have a, a there's actually a, a particular ratio between handle to blade uh, and that gives you performance. And then balance point, I usually like mine about an inch and a half to an inch and three quarters in front of the handle material. Um, the way the the way the uh, blade is measured is basically from tip to the cutting edge right here, or where the handle the the furthest most forward point of the handle material um, that could be no more than ten inches. And so we're bound by the measurements. There's actually a jig that we use to measure each knife. Each knife is measured before every competition, mm -hmm. even if that knife has been measured in every other competition it's been in. And so as far as the handle goes, mine, you, there's a little bit of grip tape, but this is a combination of uh, canvas micarta and then uh, inlaid rubber. Ooh, um, okay. And now this particular knife is my design but it's actually made by Carruthers Performance Knives. Nathan Carruthers uh, is, is the, the mastermind of this. He was able to take my design and create something that we made a batch of like a hundred or so. And, and we're giving people the opportunity to use a knife that I would use for competition so that they could own and experience that. And so I actually compete with this very knife. I mean, I have my other customs that i compete with this is the one that i i i, I will compete in nationals and worlds with uh this year and hopefully we can win another one and uh and 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 put that together and stuff i'm a little uh go ahead did what what part of the questions haven't i answered yet oh you you've answered them all but actually uh this raises another one just just examining this knife i see the swedge across uh you know 90 percent of the spine of the blade and i'm yeah. wondering what the swedge is for is that just for weight reduction or weight management weight? yeah okay also it gives you board relief um this is actually the way that this grind is you can't see it because um it's so subtle but it's slightly hollow ground. Mm, um, okay. If you put like, maybe I can make you see it. If you put like a credit card and let's go in the light. Oh, yes, there we go. Yes, just flick it. You can see that light gets underneath there. And then with that part of the anatomy, and this was, this was uh, part of my design development that creates a, a, an interaction with wood and gives you a thinner edge as long as your material can handle it. And then this wedge is about relief. This wedge right here is for spreading, right here is for spreading the wood apart right as you, you penetrate into the wood and then the chip will pop. And you'll see when I chop, you'll see a lot of times I'm throwing chunks of wood mm -hmm. and that's that factor of the blade. Um, and then it also lowers the center of gravity just a little bit to give you more control. Also with um, the way I drop the handle right here, this recess right here, a lot of people run their handle all the way up to here. I dropped it in particular because the center of mass of the knife, like around here, is lined up with the hand when it's in, in your hand. So the strongest part of my hand is lined up with the center of the knife. It helps with aiming, and then it also helps with uh, generating power and getting penetration into wood. What so? What are these competitions? Before we move move away from the competitions and talk about, I want to really get into your investigation of swords because that, to me, like I mentioned. Um, but before we move on, I'm I'm still I'm fascinated by blade sports, and um, you know, it's this. Uh, they seem like very uh, 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 like really uh, cool gatherings. I don't know how else to put it. What What are they like when you go to one of these uh, competitions? Oh, we're the interesting thing about our sport is that it's small enough that we all know each other 
and everybody has to participate in everything other than cutting as well. So the people that are judging and scoring you are your competitors, but they're also your friends. And so it's kind of an interesting dynamic because we're not big enough to be like have independent experts to be officials, to be judges and set up courses for us. So we're setting up each other's course and we're judging each other and officiating each other and, and we're training each other. Um, there's different, I'm a, I'm a, a trainer to the trainers. So I, I um, there's a few of us that, that can train trainers or just train uh, new cutters. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's an interesting, it, we're just a pretty close knit group. So the biggest thing is, you know, the cutting competitions are what you see on the video, but the hang is basically what all of us travel for. I, I fly right. all over the country, um, sponsored by uh, Peter's Heat Treat in Pennsylvania, and they uh, they fly me all over to go cut things up. But also, we, we you know, then we always go plan a cool place to do dinner. Or we do a cookout. Um, it's a, just a great group of guys uh, and gals because we have a women's competition, as, a, a women's division as well. And uh, just, just neat people. But there is that that interesting factor that it's, you know, the referees are your opponents, but they're also um, part of your community in, in a sense. Yeah. Something that couldn't exist without trust and friendship. Yeah. Is basically. Um, yeah. So uh, knife or death, the TV show. Yes. The, the, the one TV show that I've ever seen that actually popularized blade sports or, or attempted to uh, did you compete on that show or, or what, what did you feel about that show? Yeah, I was on season. So actually, um, I was contacted during the development process of of uh, Knife or Death. And I, I was like, yeah, I'll go do it. But they actually slated me for um, to be one of the um, uh, the hosts. And so oh. instead of being a competitor, they were going to have me. I think they had Goldberg already. And I was either going to do the position that two lambs did or that uh, Travis Wirtz did. Mm, okay. And I talked with them and stuff, but um, they didn't like me, I guess. So uh, they, did, they didn't pick me for that. Uh, and then I was like, can I do the cut? Can I at least, you know, go on the show? And they didn't let me go on the first season. So uh, I was actually kind of, uh, it was a little, I was like, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> I, I wanted to do it. it was, I thought it would be really really cool i saw the season come out actually uh there were a few, there were three or four blade sport competitors that were on there uh chris uh barry big chris knives mm -hmm. uh Dwayne unger and uh jesse elias uh was there using one of my knives and then uh james clifton was also on it and i'm trying to think if there was anybody else on blade sports that went there for season one uh and it was interesting there there were some neat things about it. It was neat to have a production company and a production company's uh, budget that, but however, that was the example of where people were putting things together that didn't completely understand cutlery. Mm -hmm. I don't think there should be rocks in any target <laughs> that you're cutting with a knife. It's just maybe my personal preference, but I don't make knives to cut rocks yeah, yeah. and a knife that is made to cut rocks doesn't cut anything else at all. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I'm trying to remember all the different. There were some pretty cool features, but one with rocks. What was that? Yeah, they had like the bucket of sand and rocks. Right. They also had like PVC pipe that was filled with uh, uh, rocks and sand. And uh, there was and then a lot of the bracketing they used was like metal. Some of it was heat treated metal. So there was a lot of ways to damage a, a blade on those courses and blade sports. Anytime, pretty much everything your knife is going to hit if you miss is wood. So right, you're not okay. going to damage your knife and stuff. But they would like literally hold a piece of fruit with a metal bracket um, or rods or screws in it or something like that. And, you know, it was just one of those things where, like, if you took someone like me, I, I would have been like, oh, let's set this up a little differently. Um, they had chains hanging things and stuff like that, chains into the target. And so you could hit a chain. Um, and the thing is, is that what people don't understand is a, a, a custom knife or a custom sword, even if it's, you know, really good and high performance and stuff like that, isn't made to cut a chain. Yeah. It just... Um, it may not break from a chain, but it's going to mess the edge up. And then if you got to go do uh, other stuff where you've got to cut like a fibrous rope or uh, a ratchet strap or something like that, that you need sharpness, um, you're going to um, 
you're going to mess it up. And so actually the, the K 18 is what I came up with after competing on knife for death. Um, so I took a, I took actually a version of the super assassin that is similar to this prototype right here. So this is, um, a, uh, a prototype that I'm working on. And this is a, a different version of the super assassin, uh, with a longer handle. I'm seeing if I can get, there we go <laughs> like that um and there's the edge so i took something like this on knife or death and it worked really well uh the the challenge that i had with knife or death was when season two came around uh they contacted me right away and they're like hey we're doing another season jump right in so i did the application again filled out everything and they actually called me up on my birthday after waiting for months. And they're like, yeah, we're not going to bring you on. Uh, you, we'll put you like as an alternate or something, but we, we need, we need somebody that's maybe a, a different gender or a different, uh, not you person. <laughs> <laughs> we got enough of them, the, the ones that are like you. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, good. Um, good with a knife. <laughs> Or, 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 you know, good with like my descent or something. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I got you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I think somebody got sick or whatever like that. They called me up and like, Hey, can you get to Atlanta in like two days? And it was kind of interesting because I was working on this knife, this sword for uh knife or death. But when they called me up and it was like, I just kind of went like, huh, again, you know? And I set it on the shelf. And mm -hmm. so it wasn't, it wasn't finished. Um, it needed to some different work, but it wasn't quite finished. And so when they called me up and I was like, yeah, you got to ship your knife like uh, tomorrow morning. And so I like worked all night and, and literally the epoxy and everything was curing while it was going to Atlanta Wow, where they filmed it. Why stuff. did they and need I, your, why did they need your sword so early or your knife? Well, no, they, Cause I was flying there in a day or two, but they wanted oh, to get oh, the okay. sword there first. Uh, well, you know, they want to get the, the blade there yeah. and stuff. And so I, I didn't get to bring my, uh, I mean, I always test. That's one of the things I'm known for is how I test my blades. And um, you find so much out. You, you never know how a blade works. Even if you've made it before until you, you take it to its limits and stuff. It's like a race car. You know, you can't just put a race car together and go out and try to run, you know, the Indianapolis 500 or go Formula One or anything like that. You're going to hit the track and test and tune it for a while. Um, so I get to the, I get to, to um, Atlanta, I get on the show uh, and, and I compete and, you know, some things went well, some things just didn't go as well as I wanted to. Um, I, I lost my first, uh, uh, in the finals of the, of the episode that I was on and, uh, uh, yeah, just kind of went on, but then on the, on the, on the way home, uh, I, I came up with a knife design that I wish I would have taken, um, uh, to, 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 uh, a, a situation like that. And part of the, the double edge of the K18 is, you know, you mentioned like, it's like a three handed sword. It has multiple positions to, to grip based off whatever you're in, in, encountering, uh, whether you're encountering a, a, a very light moving fast target, there's a part of you put it on the handle. You can, you can operate at one hand. If you're cutting something that you just need a lot of power, like, I mean, I, I showed uh, chopping two by fours in one hit or that kind of stuff. Um, you can get the hand position for that. And then you can save that back edge because that back edge is extra thin and actually designed like basically like a sit, like a, a sickle what's the thing the grim reaper has yeah yeah it's like a side yeah, it's got like the, a side. Yeah. yeah and it's like you hold it and it's like for for ropes and meat and everything like that and it can be extra sharp because that's protected from rocks and all the other crap that they put in right. uh to their targets oh. um another thing that they did was um it was really interesting and i don't think they thought this out but because they obviously they didn't have the experience of this but there's different techniques. If you do sword training, you know, you want to cut with particular angles. Uh, you have a, a sequence of cuts, you know, uh, in, in the Japanese there, you know, it's basically you got a forehand or a backhand or a flat cut, or you're doing up cuts, but you're never, you're very rarely just smashing your, your sword into something without, with just the intent of hitting a, like a baseball bat. 
But some of the targets, that's actually what you had to do. So if you take a PVC pipe and you fill it full of rocks, you make it really dense. If you cut it like you're cutting like a tatami mat, the sword will actually glance off. It's too much mass. The sword's not able to get purchased. You are you literally just need to smack it like a baseball bat because you're just going to fracture the PVC pipe. And it's not even cutting. Um, it's just hmm. It's just smashing and stuff. And so it was kind of interesting because it was kind of like an area where people got selected based off of like you see people that are well-trained cutters and they go to like a, a a technique that they've practiced and they they get disqualified. Well, they they lose at that point in time. And then somebody just comes over and baseball bat swings it, um, gets through. And it's kind of an interesting filtration. I don't think they planned it out. It's how it turned out. But it was it was kind of one of those uh those interesting dynamics it's basically like you know uh being on a racetrack and if you if you drive it like a a, a demolition derby then um you win <laughs> when you're you're basically supposed to just go faster than everybody yeah that's what i'm thinking uh, you you call it uh, a filtration but it's not necessarily the right filter <laughs> it's not no, the right size not, not what we would consider ideal but the other thing though is that you have to realize they're making it's much like fortune fire they're making entertainment. The mm -hmm. drama is part of the product. The failure is 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 something that they can sell uh, to the public because I guess maybe the public can identify with that part because people have had failure in their lives or or they 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 like the drama. Um, so it is kind of interesting um, when you have producers they're producing content and uh, entertainment versus. Let's see what's capable with blades and who can do it. You know, I, it, for some reason, that just doesn't seem as interesting to the masses. Now, to the people that buy my stuff, they're super interested in that. Mm -hmm. But it's it, it's all depends on, you know, what, what track you're running on. So let's talk about the people who buy your stuff is uh, are so you make a wide variety of, of things from from Japanese inspired knives and swords mm -hmm. to these competition in inspired swords and knives mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of everything in between. What, uh, who are your main customers and what do you, uh, what are they using these things for? You know, I have, uh, so I have quite a few customers that have been with me for years. I mean, some of them have been over 10 years. They've been customers of mine. And so I have enough customer base that, I have a standing list of people that if I were to post anything, they literally just like my emails light up and they're like, I'll take that and, and, and everything. So it's a great place to be in. So, um, you know, my customers are just people that really appreciate the authenticity, uh, 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 being authentic and having things that are built to be extremely durable, but also balanced and functional and and capable and that's due to the the metallurgical science and the, a lot of the experience that I've, I've gained by pushing the limits and understanding what things work in blade sports so we're looking at uh, right now we're looking at uh, these very japanese style blades i mean you uh the the k18 is a is a big full tang profile slab of a knife these are yeah. very different these are put together in a very uh, different and deliberate way. Of course, yes. the K18 is deliberate, but this is a different process altogether. Tell us about the process of making these very complex Japanese swords. Okay. So, um, you know, I uh, the Japanese swords are, man, they, they figured out uh, some amazing ways of putting things together. And due to some of the limitations of their materials and their metal uh, metallurgy, they've developed some techniques to overcome those. Um, one of the interesting things is say you take like the, the, the Asame wrap around the handle. Mm -hmm. And that was like a laminated composite handle before that became a thing. You basically take a wood, you cut the negatives and you put the two halves together. The tang goes in there, but then you reinforce it by wrapping uh Same and Same works a lot like rawhide uh, where you, um, as it's wet, you can form it. And then as it's, as it dries, it constricts and and forms a really durable uh, a really durable surface, um, which uh, is it's it's like if you ever try to cut it with a saw or something like that, it's really hard to yeah. cut. 
Same like, is the ray skin. The ray skin, yes. Okay. Um, shark skin, ray skin. They they uh, can use them interchangeably, but the same has uh, presentation nodes where they get like the belly button of the uh, of, of the ray, and you put them in a certain spot. And there's a lot of tradition to it. Um, I've always been, you know, enamored by uh antique japanese swords i have thought you know i just just holding on to a piece of history is just really cool and just you know knowing that these pieces have been used in battle so i took the a lot of their designs and everything like that but this story is what the one i was i was telling me to get back to i was in a dojo with a friend of mine and the sensei of the dojo was like a 10th degree in Shotokan karate. And he'd been over to Japan and he was given this uh, Nihonto uh, Japanese sword, a, a, a traditional Japanese sword that was quite old, you know, for, for being uh, over there and being so accomplished in his martial arts. And we were doing some demonstration cutting at this dojo and somebody had a, uh, gotten a hold of that sword that was not very skilled and used it and bent it and twisted it. And what they did is because the, the grass mats, the, the, the tatami is set on top of like a dowel and it's the dowel is sharp. You just set it right down. It's all rolled up and then you cut it. Well, this person got a little bit low and got into the stand, which is made out of four by four and wooden dowel, but the sword had taken enough. It, it twisted and bent and then my friend and I, we took the sword to uh, a Japanese uh, polisher over in Seattle, and he charged like $900 to straighten and, and polish this sword. And I was like, what if we could just make a sword that could cut up the 4 by 4 but still be like every all the handling and all the tradition of that? And so I started to explore the, 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 the steel, uh, different steels that could do that. Um, and not only do that, but do that on a very consistent basis. I use a lot of CPM metallurgy. I use a lot of particle metallurgy. And not that like basic carbon steel is bad, but what I'd found previously in my uh, experimentation with heat treat and forging and developing with carbon steels is what from batch to batch, the consistency was not measured. It, it was not consistent enough for me to, to not have to reinvent the wheel every time I got a new batch of steel. So I found that with like more precise steels, um, you could go from batch to batch and, and all of the gains that you had made and the research and development you did, would apply to the next batch of steel from the previous batch of steel. You wouldn't have a setback. You know, if someone wants you to make a big sword that can perform and you've shown that you can do that and all of a sudden you get a new batch of steel and this one isn't as good as the previous mm -hmm. one, it's really hard to send that out to the customer and be like, oh yeah, it's kind of as good, but maybe not. Yeah. You know, and I, 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 I really value honesty and, and I just be like, I wouldn't want to get something that wasn't as good as what I thought I was getting. So I went to my, you know, the processes. So I, I, I ended up on CPM 3V. I found it was like the best balance of, you know, you can get a tougher steel like, like, um, uh, S7, but S7 didn't have the edge capabilities that I wanted for a sword because, Part of my swords is how long they stay sharp, but also part is how much impact they can withstand. Mm -hmm. And it's a great combination to have because you can get basic spring steel and you can just have all the impact in the world, but you're dull after two or three cuts. And so uh, I found that, well, let's, let's, let's maintain knife-like sharpness while being extremely durable, being able to bend to like 90 degrees and come back to straight. And, and so that's how I ended up with uh, CPM 3V based on the different testing and then spent like 10 years refining the heat treat protocol oh, okay. and partnering with uh, the company that sponsors me, Peter's Heat Treat, because I basically get to do experiments with their hundreds and or millions of dollars worth of vacuum furnaces. And then uh, Nathan Carruthers, the person who made the competition chopper that took my design and was able to produce it, um, he had also been doing parallel experimentation. Then we started comparing notes and we developed a protocol called Delta 3V. Um, and then our uh, our friend, uh, my friend that sponsors me, Brad at Peter's Heat Treat, he actually got Peter's Heat Treat to designate a furnace just to do our protocol because the, the protocol actually puts more demand on the furnace than what the factory would recommend that they do it. it, it the heat cycle, the heating and the cooling and the, the rate of that exceeds what the standard, the industry standard would allow. But he was able to 
get the engineer in there and we program the specific furnace. So we run our, our proprietary heat treat through those, um, that, that furnace particularly. So is that a, um, a protocol that, that Delta three V protocol, is that something you can license and sell to other makers? How does that work? Um, you know, we, we've had people that have asked for it. Um, there is one company that was in part of the development called survive knives. He's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. His name's yeah. guy cipher and he was using it for a bit, but because of his manufacture process, it didn't quite work. A uh, Delta three V requires that you have the majority of the blade shaped before heat treat, mm -hmm. but guys process required just heating a, a profile blank, but no bevels ground. Okay. And that affects the rate of cooling with, with the edge and the, the thermal mass of the blade. So he was not getting the quench rate uh, that was necessary to be, uh, to, to achieve the performance that we would get with Delta 3V. Um, other companies have, um, other companies have uh, asked us, but the challenge is, is that if you give that out, and somebody else gets to put that that Delta 3V on their their blade, they have to hold a standard, you know? Mm. And the thing about Delta 3V is small batch. You can't do huge batches. It's like even even big, even big runs of, of hundreds of knives have to be broken up into very small batches uh, so that the blades can be properly spaced, so that they can all get exposed to the right atmosphere, to the to the right heat, the right cooling, the, the, the rate, the proper cryo. Um, all those things have to be um, done particularly. And we'd, it would, you know, it's just, it would, you would have to manage that because had they, if they put that out into the market and it didn't perform up to a standard that we've been known for, then that would put a tarnish in the, the integrity of Delta 3B. And so we're really, really particular. And because it's a, it's a community that we've all come up with this, everybody has to agree to allow mm -hmm. another company to lease it or something like that. So we've actually, each of us have come in and Hey, who, what do you think if so-and-so does this or that? Um, now, if a company were to like, say, uh, you know, something like spider co knives or Boker or, or something like that, if they wanted to collaborate with me uh, on a sense or with Nathan and the stuff, then we discuss. And then under my, collaboration so those knives would have my insignia and boker mm -hmm. or or spider co um then we could run those through like a delta 3v in, in a sense because we basically have the heat treat control and stuff but it's a real um it sounds controlling but it the science does what the science does and if you vary from it it doesn't do it anytime well, yeah. that we've had variations happen because we have standards and i have a a, a wall of of test standards and stuff. And if I get something back and I'm like, this is not acting like this. And then we'll run it through testing and, and see if, if something's off and every now and then you catch something and you're like, okay, we got to reevaluate this or what's going on. That's how we found, you know, the process of which we space them, the process of which we divide up larger batches and that stuff, mm -hmm. because we had a few things that happened. It was like, these are not performing up to the standard that we would put the, the signia on. And so, um, so we're going to have to reevaluate and make sure that we're, we're achieving that standard. And I just can't, we just don't trust that everybody else is going to do that. Oh yeah. I mean, it just makes sense. If, if, if it, uh, if Delta three V stands for a very particular set of parameters and performance standards, um, and, and then, and then it gets licensed out and, and it gets botched even once, then it, defeats its entire purpose it's now completely meaningless <laughs> you know what i yeah. mean it's like it's like are you gonna let hyundai make a bugatti yeah <laughs> you know like no, no. It, yeah um so i i am interested in these uh, uh parallel sort of processes between making that full tang double-edged chopper the k18 uh -huh. and and one of these refined uh, uh, super assassins. Uh, not that the not that the K eighteen is unrefined. That's not what I'm saying. But yeah, like I said, very very different process. When you're making a a a, a tr more traditional Japanese blade, uh, is that a totally different process than when you're making uh, the K eighteen, for instance? Yeah, yeah. Um, the K eighteen initially, I made I've made about ten or so in the shop K 18s where I started from start to finish. And then uh, the K-18s that, then 
like uh, the competition choppers, uh, Carruthers knives started making them. Mm -hmm. And the full thing is there's two parts. One, it, it is set up to for the ease of manufacture. I prefer hidden tang over over um exposed i mean all my pieces are still full tang my tang generally runs the full length of the handle or or 90 percent of it even if it's a, a long handle but the um the hidden tang is is just easier to produce with their methods mm -hmm. and so i mean not the hidden tang the the full mm -hmm. tang or, or exposed tang is is easier to produce with their methods and then making scales and it's it, it was able to get it into a price point that just isn't accessible with with my handmade pieces and stuff so but because we collaborate and we we use the same heat treat protocol my stuff will go in with their stuff and their stuff will go in with my stuff and we just space it properly and it all goes in the same the same batch um nathan just has so much more capability like you're i'm not gonna grind 140 or so i think that's how many we might have done with the first batch of them uh i don't know if nathan's gonna do them because my designs are really hard to produce because the demands of the geometry is it it, it creates a lot of challenges and when you think you're gonna be able to make a profit you end up having to redo some things or this and that and it's, it's hard to, to scale it's hard to scale the custom design and stuff so that, but the K18 was kind of uh, put together with that intent to, you know, take on something like Knife or Death, where you have unpredictable challenges, but you have a lot of options based off the performance characteristics. Something like one of my um, my Super Assassins or my um, uh, Japanese katanas and stuff. You, we still have all the the uh, performance characteristics, but they're a little more refined and hand done in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're usually three, four or six times the cost mm -hmm. and stuff. They're just, they're, so um, yeah, that's, that's about the extent of that. In, in terms of uh, robustness, uh, would, would you feel uh, just as comfortable taking, taking a hidden tang um, a katana, Japanese katana uh, through a course like knife or death, uh, that that you've made obviously uh as you would something full tang like that big k18 yeah well my the 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 blade that i took on uh knife or death was hidden tang it oh, was okay it was it had uh there it is it had this handle construction right here there's literally one pin that holds this together right here the tang goes to about there oh, um wow. and it, it the so what what i've done with this particular design one of the things is the the handle material is tarot tough uh, tarot tough is selected over my Carter or G10 one. I just hate working with G10 cause it's, uh, it's literally glass fibers everywhere mm -hmm. and it's just not good for you. Um, I am a doctor and I do know the long-term effects of those things. And, uh, and I don't want to have those anyways, but my card is pretty durable, but, but tarot tough is it's a material. And the way I would test this is you take an eighth inch strip of tarot tough G10 and my Carta, and I'll put it on my anvil and I'll hit the G10 and I can usually break the G10 in half in two hits. Hmm. Uh, the canvas micarta might take four to six hits. The tarot tough, you can just sit there and smack on it. And you it literally you turn it into pulverization before it fractures. It's just, um, it has a different canvas. It has a different resin. Um, it is not expected to be shiny. It is not expected to, um, to be really pretty it's just expected to be really durable it's used for um it's made by a company out of oregon and it's used for bushings for deep water welling to, uh, to take and huh. be impregnated with lubricants and take a lot of pressure and a lot of industrial forces and, and so and so it works great for handle material but then i'll take that handle and i will encase it in carbon fiber this is um this is there's no seam in this carbon fiber and this carbon fiber is in case is surrounding um, the uh, the tarot tough. So every way that this handle can fail is reinforced by the strongest capability of the material that that mm -hmm. prevents that failure. So this handle can't crack because all this carbon fiber is extremely resistant to to being pulled apart. And the only way you're going to crack this handle is to pull that carbon fiber apart. The only way you're going to mash this handle or get it loose is to compress that tarot tough. But that tarot tough is, is meant for a bearing and it's extremely resistant to compression. So you've got resistance to compression, 
resistance to, to uh, distraction. You also have resistance to torsion, which torsion is usually the way you destroy um, hard materials. And so there's no place for it to fail. And then the cap, this right here and this right here are, are, are machine billet titanium. Uh, and so there's no seams or no welding. This is all from a billet and I cut these out um, you know, and machine them out. And so there's nowhere for anything to go. And so the handles don't, you, the, this is literally a handle that you pull that pin, everything can come out. But the way the Japanese did it was everything is a wedge going into a, a negative and the deeper and more force you put it in, the more it secures itself. Mm -hmm. So the very fact of trying to break it strengthens it. And that's kind of the approach of the, of the swords that I do. So I can chop a two by four in one hit with this piece. I can cut a tree that's, you know, four to six inches in diameter, depending on what type of wood it is with this and not have to worry about this handle coming apart, even though it's just one pin holding it. So that carbon fiber wrapping the Terra Tough is like the Same wrap, doing the same exact yes. thing. Yes. Uh, how do you have it without a seam, or is that something that you figured out that you know you ever see a Chinese finger trap? Yeah. Yeah, the carbon fiber comes like a Chinese finger trap. Oh, you no put thing. it over, and as you pull it apart, it tightens down. It's so like cool. it's like steel braiding on a hose for a for like a um uh a car for for like the the um uh coolant hosing. And stuff like that you could put steel braiding over that or like steel braiding for brake lines mm -hmm. how they reinforce something for like race cars and or motorcycles and stuff so i selected that carbon fiber and then the resins that i use uh there's a company called solar composites and they do a lot of marine and industrial applications so everything is just overbuilt with the very best that i can come up with and if i and if the, and i'm not um I'm not beholden to anything. If there's something better, if there's a steel better than 3V, I'll use it. If there's a, a, a carbon fiber or a resin better than what I'm using, I'll use it. I, I don't have uh, favorites. My favorites are the very best. And so that's what I offer with my customers. And my customers, are there's not a lot of them, but there's there's enough of them, and they appreciate that. And, and they also know that, like, with the waiting list on my pieces, if you buy one of my pieces in it, if you need to – you know, because they're expensive, you need to get out of the money or, or, or get money back. There's a market for them. And most people make quite a bit of money if they buy one of my pieces and then, you know, decide they need to sell it to like, you know, help buy their house or something. Right, right. Uh, yeah, uh, we're we're all guilty from time to time to buy uh, of buying a blade that perhaps was not uh, well timed financially. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> I do that with uh, blades, firearms, things sometimes. Yes. So as an artist, uh, describe to me where you're, where you're, where you go differently when you're making the more traditional Japanese, because you're uh, Japanese swords, because you're holding up that sword and I'm looking at the, at the hilt. And you said that was um, milled out. I'm sorry, the, the, the Tsuba or whatever that uh, the cross Suba, The Tsuba, Fuchi, and Kashira, they're all out of titanium. They're versus... all milled out of a single piece, correct? Uh, yes. I mean, like, okay. So at, that's very different from when you're making something traditional. You're carving yeah. out the suba. You're carving out that little part that that cuff and all that. Yeah, the, there's two cups. One's the top one. That's the fuchi, and the bottom one's the kashira. And um, a lot of times they're made out of. They can be made out of just mild steel. They can be made out of non-ferrous metals like copper, bronze, brass. Um, and then they have, there's other metal mixtures that are traditional Japanese that I haven't really done much of. I did take some jewelry courses and, uh, one of the particular aspects was to work with those metals and solder. So my habakis, um, which are the collar that goes on the blade. And I don't really have a great example. There's some examples of, of, a uh, on my swords. Those are usually non-ferrous metals. They start as just a flat bar you forge them around you have to learn how to solder them so the seams interact with the the texture or they're just not really visible and you also have to select the right solder to maintain durability um but uh i chose titanium because the only downside to titanium that i see is the difficulty in working it but once you figure out how to work it once you get your shapes and stuff there's i mean they're, they don't, they don't rust they're extremely durable. Um, I more durable than steel pound for pound. Um, 
and then you can anodize them. You'll see a lot of my pieces are they're they're anodized or uh, uh, colored with fire. Um, I can work in different textures and in that sense. Um, I just consider them a superior form. I think if uh, in ancient Japan, in Edo period Japan, or something like that, if they had the technology to do that, um, they would have done that. I also think with 3V, if they if they had come across a mountain and were able to dig up CPM 3V and figure out the Delta heat treat protocol, we'd all be speaking Japanese right now. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's cool. And we'd all be carrying awesome, awesome three V swords. It, it could be pretty awesome. Yeah. What, what's your gorilla logo about? Um, you know, that's, uh, the gorilla thing is just, it's a, it's a funny joke with my friends. Um, and then my daughter back in the day, she always like, we'd always just play and she always called it playing gorilla. And she always just like would tell people, tell people that her dad's a gorilla. And so, um, it stuck. Um, she's, she actually went off to college this year. She's 19, but oh, wow. uh, she'll still tell you stories about that. And, uh, and so it, it stuck amongst my friends and everything like that. So originally I wanted to put like, um, the idea for the logo was like a gorilla doing the thinker pose, the whole, oh. <laughs> you know, yeah. like yeah. this, but it just didn't turn out good in a logo, and it, it actually looked like the Michelin man taking a shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, not a good look. <laughs> we were like, so then I was talking to the guy, uh, his name is Rock Claus, and uh, his dad, uh, Don Claus, made some beautiful knives that I really uh, was um, enamored with when I first got into knife making, and still am. If I ever come across one and could afford it, I would buy one just because uh, um, he inspired me. And, uh, he'd worked out the graphic with me and we'd gone back and forth and I drew on it and then he drew on it. And, and finally we just came up with it. It's like the gorilla is, it, you can see what it is and it's a little cartoonish, but it's also, um, you know, it's, it's imperfect, but perfect at the same time. And then once I saw it and I was just like that, we're doing that. And it, it shows up on the blades really well. Actually, here's, um, here's a little uh a little fighting knife that i'm about to send out to a customer Ooh, and there nice. well let's see if we can go there it is right there yeah that is cool and so this is the tarot tough material um the cool thing about this tarot tough material let me get back there we go um is it you know you just can't expect it to be pretty but the interaction with with your hand and it the the wetter and sloppier it gets the better this stuff grips and it's just like the design of the rest of my pieces. The things that are supposed to make it fail actually make it stronger. And so um, that's just kind of one of the approaches that I do with with the uh, the performance that I want out of the pieces I make. Uh, okay, before you put that beautiful piece away, let's talk about this for a quick second. Uh, and then I want and then I want to find out for everyone else uh, how they can get behind the wheel of a Dan Keffler. But but hold up this knife here, this fighter, this unexpected. A little Easter egg of a be oh, this is beautiful here. Um, so here's uh, the, is that a is that a go. sharpened swedge there? Uh, it can be uh -huh. depending on demand. Okay. It is pre sharpened, which means it's about at um, about 10 thou, okay, right there. Let's see if we can get focused. I don't know if we're going to get focused right there. It's about 10 thousandths right there, and that that part runs from here to mm -hmm. here. And this original fighting design was um, designed uh, particularly from a request from a, a friend of mine who uh, they do a lot of um, hog hunting in uh, oh, down okay. south. And uh, there's a lot of design to a, um, a piece that will probably dispatch of a of a hog with, you know, without taking much time and uh, and getting getting the business done the most humane way possible. Mm -hmm uh, in, in that sense. And so, um, so yeah, this is a anodized, uh, one, I mean, solid piece of, of Man. titanium for the, for the guard. And then, um, that's just, just different color anodization, the gold rings. And then it's a tarot tough, a tarot tough handle. So what do you hear back from the field? How do these perform? Uh, with the I get pigs? pictures and uh, uh, everybody they is, they, they, um, it's fortunately, I, they're, they're very highly coveted. Mm -hmm. um, those that have them do not sell them and they get offered uh, like 
enormous amounts uh, for pieces that 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 usually like I'm like these are just functional user pieces. These are not like um, man. I mean, you take. Do you know who Mike Quisenberry is? No, I don't. Um, Quisenberry. Yeah. Yeah, He's I think a, I do. Uh, NBA, very NBA fancy. Master. Just just gorgeous. Just absolutely the um um there's a couple guys that are like him that I just walk around the table at Blade and you know they're getting extremely high dollar for their pieces, but it's like, yeah, that took you a year of just going into the shop <laughs> yeah. every now and then and just working for hours on like I cut the flower out of the handle here, and then I had to do that 50 more times, you know, and 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 it's just and the engraving and all the just amazing stuff. I mean, Mike he does some stuff that just makes me like, you know, it, one of the things I really admire is like, if I had taken his path when I started, I don't think I could do what he does. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I'm just like, just a talent beyond me in, in certain ways. Um, there's a, there's quite a few makers uh, that I feel that way with that have gone down their genre. And I just, I just am enamored and I just allow myself to be awestruck because, um, I just don't see myself going that direction. Uh, I have my passion this way. But all of a sudden I start getting prices, like people st start getting offered stuff and they'll tell me what they get offered and they turn down. I'm just like, dude, you should take it. I'll just make, <laughs> yeah, I'll make you another one. You should, you, you should just do that. I mean, but it is, yeah, it is interesting. There are people that generally, I mean, there's like, you know, you could go buy the car that, um, you go buy the car that's, you know, that people can get and it's super fast and it's really pretty, but you could also go try to buy the one that won like, you know, a formula one race or, or something like that. And those ones that actually can do the thing um, that are just designed purpose, there's a value in that. And people really see that it's not a large portion of people, but it's enough to sell my stuff to for sure. Okay, Dan. So say that, uh, say that someone out there listening is, has to have one of your, one of your pieces. What's the best way for people to line themselves up to get a Dan Keffler? <sighs> it is, um, it's challenging right now. Um, you know, usually Instagram is the way that people contact me. Um, there is quite a bit of backlog. Um, just people, if you introduce yourself, tell me what you're interested in, understand that it's going to take a lot of time and it may not be something I can do, but uh, I have been working on different ways to produce more pieces um, I'm really limited on how much I can produce because I have the, the standards that I hold unless I can, you know, if I can do something, you know, in a batch and I can maintain the standards on each piece, then, um, then, uh, uh, I I'll do that. But, uh, it's just, it's very difficult. Um, but the, the, the one way you don't get it is if you just, chime in and be like hey how much is that yeah. um that yeah. those don't those those messages don't uh don't really get you very far i, I got other things to do yeah. um but if people are really interested introduce yourself um i usually everybody i sell something to i actually call on the phone and we have a conversation because i'm really interested just like if you go to a doctor's office and you have a problem and you want to know what's wrong with it the doctor should ask you like questions for at least 15 minutes just to get a good understanding of what direction to take. And I treat my knives that way, you know, because sometimes people think they want something and there's a couple of reasons to want something. One is just because you have to have it and you want it to, to have it. And that's a valid reason. Other reasons are I might actually do something with this that I need. I might, I might actually deploy overseas and I might have to use this piece for uh, circumstances that are unpredictable. And then the benefit of working with someone like me is like, let's explore the options and what's possible and what can happen. And let's make sure that your bases are covered and, and, and you have a plan for irregular situations that you might have to use this in, in ways that um, you didn't imagine and stuff. So yeah, it was a long answer to your question. Uh, contact me, introduce yourself. Uh, and you know, if, if we're serious, we'll talk on the phone and we'll see if we can work something out. Great. Dan, I'll, I'll be calling you right after the show. All right. <laughs> Dan, thanks so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast. It's been great meeting you, sir. Hey, nice meeting you. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I, I had a lot of fun. Awesome. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. Right. Ever order a knife online and have it delivered to the office so your wife doesn't know? Chances are you're a knife junkie. 
Yeah, that's what I'll be doing with the K-18, having it sent to the office, and then somehow I'll have to hide that missing chunk of cashish. Just kidding. Uh, but yeah, one day I would love to have uh, any one of those uh, things we just discussed. doesn't have to be a K-18. I'm not that picky. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us and uh, Dan Keffler on the Knife Junkie podcast. Be sure to check us out on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And of course, Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Facebook, Twitch, and of course, right here on YouTube for Thursday Night Knives, where you get to uh, join the conversation. Also, be sure to download the podcast to uh, your podcast apps and listen to us while you mow the lawn or drive to work. Until next time. I'm Bob DeMarco saying for Jim, who works all of this magic, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.